In this lesson, we're going to talk about the powers of Congress under Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution. And specifically here, we're going to want to focus on the taxing power, the spending power, the commerce power, and the necessary and proper clause, again, under Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution. Important to recognize, right, of course, these aren't the only powers that are vested to Congress under Article 1, Section 8. This is a small sampling. We will put the rest of the powers enumerated under Article 1, Section 8 below this video with a little bit of discussion there. But these are the main powers, right, that are going to present themselves on our constitutional law fact pattern. These are in real life some of the most important powers that Congress relies on again and again to pass law. So we're really going to deep dive on these in this video. Again, also these are kind of some of the powers I feel like really warrant a deeper discussion and these are the most requested topics from you guys. So again, these are the powers we're really going to focus on in this video. But in important to recognize that these aren't the only powers and below this video right we'll put the rest of them down there so please make sure you check that out after you finish watching this so that you can have comprehensive coverage fully comprehensive coverage of article 1 section 8. Okay, but if we take a step back for a second, think about the big picture, the issue spotting here. What are we getting at with the powers of Congress under Article 1, Section 8? How is this going to be presented on a constitutional law fact pattern? Right, well, the good news here is that from an issue spotting perspective, right, Article 1, Section 8 is really easy to identify, right? Or a power of Congress issue is really easy to identify on a fact pattern, right? Anytime that you have Congress, right, operative word here being Congress passing a law, right? We're not talking about state governments or any other lawmaking body. We're talking about Congress. Right? Anytime you see Congress pass a law on a constitutional law fact pattern, you have a Article 1, Section 8 powers of Congress issue, right? Anytime Congress passes a law, they have to be able to point to a specific power enumerated under Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, right? They have to say, this is the power that we're relying on to pass this law, right? It's really important to recognize that Congress can't just willy-nilly pass any law that they want, right? The Constitution vests very specific powers under Article 1, Section 8 that they may rely on to pass law. Right? So if Congress is going to pass a law, they have to be able to point to a specific power, like the taxing power, the spending power, the commerce power, or the necessary and proper clause in conjunction with any of these other powers. Right? But they have to be able to point to a power and say, look, we can pass this law because the power is vested to us in Article 1, Section 8, right? The taxing power, the spending power, the commerce power, whatever they're relying on to pass that law, right? So it's important to recognize on a constitutional law fact pattern, you have to establish what power Congress has vested to them in the U.S. Constitution to pass this law. Anytime you see Congress passing a law in a constitutional law fact pattern, Right, so from the big picture issue spotting, right, it's not too difficult, right? You are literally going to see Congress passing some type of law. The question is, does Congress have the power under Article 1 to pass this law, right? That's going to be your issue, and you're going to have to think about all these different powers. But the big ones, again, the ones that are most often tested, and most relied upon upon Congress are going to be the taxing power, the spending power, the commerce power, and the necessary and proper clause. And at the end of the video, we'll see why, right? All of these powers kind of operating in conjunction with each other give Congress very broad power to pass all kinds of different law, right? Which is what we're going to talk about in this lesson, right? And before we jump into it, right, we're going to get into the tax the taxing power here in a second, right? Another common thing that you're going to see, right? A theme you're going to see emerge as we go through this is typically, right? Congress starts out with an objective, right? There's something that they want to accomplish, right? In recent memory, right, with the Affordable Care Act, we can think about Congress 
in response to what is perceived as kind of a healthcare crisis in the United States, right, or an economic crisis, depending on how you look at it, Congress believes, right, it would be prudent for all Americans, all U.S. citizens to have health care, right? So Congress starts out with an objective, right? We want to require all U.S. citizens to have health care, right? To go out and purchase health insurance, right? So this is kind of an objective that Congress might start out with, right? For whatever reason, it doesn't matter how they've arrived at this belief, but for whatever reason, they believe it's going to be beneficial for the general welfare of the United States, for the people of the United States, that all Americans purchase health insurance, right? This is their objective. This is their starting point. So this is what they want to accomplish. But Congress can't just directly pass laws compelling people to purchase stuff, right? That's not vested to them in the U.S. Constitution, right? There's no power that says, hey, Congress, you can require or compel U.S. citizens to purchase products they may or may not want, right? Congress couldn't pass a law, you know, hey, we want citizens to be more healthy, so we're going to require every citizen purchase, you know, at least one pound of bananas every month, right? You can't compel activity, generally. You can't compel citizens to purchase things, right? Generally, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So they still nonetheless, though, have this objective they want to accomplish. So the question becomes, can they get crafty or can they be clever, flip open their pocketbook constitutions, Article 1 and Section 8, and say, hey, look, maybe we can't directly require or compel all citizens to purchase health insurance, right? We can't do that. But maybe there's a way we can use these other powers to accomplish our objective in some other way, right? And this is going to be a theme that you see emerge here. And this is something you probably will spend a lot of time talking about in a constitutional law class, right? You might even go all the way back to Hamilton versus Madison, kind of having competing views on this topic, and you'll go through like United States versus Butler, and you'll see the evolution of this. And I'm just going to tell you guys, because for your purposes on a constitutional law fact pattern, we don't need to worry about how this all evolved. The answer to this is now today, Congress is generally allowed to do that, right? They can start with an objective. We want all Americans to purchase health insurance, right? They can have an objective or an intent in their mind and then intentionally go out with their pocketbook constitution and come up with clever ways to make that objective happen, right? Staying within the power vested to them in the constitution, right? So we'll see how this plays out with the taxing power, right? So we know that Congress under Article 1, Section 8, has the power to tax, right? Congress loves this power, right? They love passing tax law, right? That's gonna increase revenue production, right? The government needs money to, right, do all the things that we rely on for the general welfare of the people, right? We need roads, we need highways, we need hospitals, we need schools, right? The government builds all of this stuff, right? Where do they get the money to build this? Well, they tax the citizens, right? They raise revenue by taxing and then they use that money to go out and build things like schools, hospitals, roads, right? Stuff that we need for the general welfare of our people, right? That's how taxing works. I'm sure everybody recognizes that. So the kind of rule here, though, we understand under the taxing power, Article 1, Section 8, Congress has the power to tax. And most taxes will be upheld if they bear some reasonable relationship to revenue production. Operative word here is some reasonable relationship. The primary purpose of the tax need not be to produce revenue right? Even though that's typically what we think of with taxes, right? Why does the government tax people, right? It's to raise revenue so they can go and spend things, you know, go have a military and have roads and whatever else, right? The government wants to spend money on, right? That's generally what we think of in terms of taxing. But it's important to recognize, like I was talking about one second ago, right? The only real test here is that the tax law bears some reasonable relationship to revenue production. And what am I talking about here? Well, we have National Federation of Independent Business v. Sabellis, right? This is 
the Affordable Care Act, right? Obamacare in 2012 being challenged, right? So if you remember this, and probably most of us do, the Affordable Care Act, remember I was talking about Congress has this objective, right? They want all Americans to purchase health insurance. They believe this is gonna be a great idea, right? For whatever reason, they think this is beneficial. We don't care really about their reasoning as to how they got there. We just need to know this is their objective, right? They think it's a good idea for all Americans to purchase health insurance. However, right, so they all sit there. I can imagine Congress sitting there. They're all pulling out their pocketbook constitutions. They flip to Article 1, Section 8, and they're reading it, and they're like, hey, but we don't have the power vested in, a, in the Constitution to do this, right? We can't directly require or compel citizens to purchase a product they may not want, right? That's not constitutional. That's not vested to us in Article 1, Section 8. We can't just go force students or go force uh, citizens to buy a product that they may not want, right? Like health insurance. But they do see the taxing power. Like, but on the other hand, we do have the power to tax, right? So let's not require or compel citizens to purchase health insurance. Let's use the taxing power and say, hey, look, you have the option to buy health insurance or not buy health insurance, but if you don't purchase health insurance, at the end of the year, you might have to pay some additional taxes, right? So of course, there's outrage over this, right? Even though the you know Congress has been doing this for decades, right? There's public outrage and there's a challenge to the Supreme Court. Hey, this isn't constitutional. Congress can't force citizens to purchase products that they don't want, right? That's not constitutional. Congress says, no, 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 that's not what we're doing. We're not compelling or requiring anybody to purchase health insurance. We're just saying, look, you have the option, but if you don't purchase health insurance, you're gonna have to pay additional taxes in some situations, right? So they pose the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare as more of a tax law under their taxing power. And the Supreme Court upholds this law. They basically say, yeah, you can do that in large part because of the taxing power, right? So this is how Congress can kind of start with an objective or an intent that they want to accomplish, right? And then go out and use these powers that they have to really, in an indirect way, accomplish their goal, right? Like, in a way forcing everybody to purchase health insurance because why would you not have health insurance if you're going to have to pay the same amount on your tax bill at the end of the year anyway you might as well purchase the insurance right so under that logic probably more people are going to purchase health insurance so it's kind of all semantics right it's a roundabout way of accomplishing their goal either way but at least they're doing it in a way that's consistent with the u.s constitution when they frame the law as a tax law, right? And that's what National Federation is all about, right? The Affordable Care Act cases that go to the Supreme Court and they're upheld, right? And again, all that really has to be shown is some relationship, some reasonable relationship to revenue production, which if it's a tax law, that's almost always going to be able to be shown, right? Some reasonable relationship to revenue production is a very, very broad test for a tax law, right? The key word here would be reasonable, right? It can't be unreasonable. And how would you end up with unreasonable? Well, there are some limitations here, right? And one of the most important cases is probably Gross Gene v. American Press Co. v. American Press Co. But the idea here in terms of limitations on the taxing power is you can't tax people in a way that's going to infringe on their constitutional rights. Remember, we said usually Congress is allowed to do that. They're allowed to start with a intent or a motive or some sort of objective and then use the taxing power to incentivize behavior to accomplish that objective. However, they're not going to be able to do that if the objective that they have is really to infringe on constitutional rights. Right. In this case, you have a tax law being passed that's going to tax certain newspapers at a higher rate. Right. And really what was going on is these newspapers are saying some unfavorable things 
about a governor. They essentially want to penalize them for doing this, so they raise the tax on newspapers, and that newspaper happens to be one that's going to have to pay this higher tax. Of course, that gets struck down, right? Even though Congress does have the power to tax, that's a clear First Amendment violation, right? You can't try to silence a newspaper that's being critical of the government by taxing them, right? Even though you have the taxing power, right? That's unreasonable, right? You're actually infringing on a company or a person's First Amendment rights, right? So all of this to say the main limitation you want to think about are going to be actual First Amendment or 14th Amendment violations, right? Free speech or religious freedom violations or free speech violations, equal protection violations. You know, hey, we're going to tax this classification of people more, right? People of this ethnicity or this race are going to have to pay more taxes or less taxes, anything like that, right? Where we actually have potential individual right violations under the first 14th amendment equal protection due process all of that is going to be struck down but as long as they're not actually infringing on constitutional rights typically as long as they can show some really reasonable relationship between the tax law and revenue production it's going to be upheld right even if it's kind of an indirect way to incentivize conduct to accomplish their objective, whatever that is, right? Which takes us to the spending power, right? The spending power is usually very tied directly to the taxing power. And it's the same idea, right? Congress has the power to spend, to provide for the common defense and general welfare. So this is again, one of these terms, right? Common defense and general welfare that has a lot of interpretation and evolution over the years. What does the Constitution mean here by general welfare, right? And again, we kind of have those conflicting views between this goes all the way back, right, to the Hamilton and Madison days, where there's some slightly different interpretations. Some views are a more narrow approach, some are broader. Today, we know that general welfare, Congress has the power to spend for the common defense and general welfare, includes almost any public purpose, not just to pursue its other enumerated powers, right? And this gets to the same idea we've been talking about, right? They can have these legislative intents or motives that they can use the taxing and spending power to accomplish so long as they're serving a public purpose, right? To provide for the common defense and general welfare. So they'd still have to show that this is providing for the common defense and general welfare. It has, it's serving, a, this law is serving a public purpose, right? But again, that's going to be very broad. Here you have South Dakota v. Dole, very famous case, where essentially Congress passes a law that conditions federal funding to highways for certain states, right? They basically say, hey, look, if you lower the drinking age, the minimum drinking age below 21, we're gonna cut your federal funding for highways 5%, right? And this goes to the Supreme Court and it is upheld, right? Congress can condition federal funding to indirectly regulate under the spending power, right? This is like the Affordable Care Act, again, where Congress kind of starts with this objective. Hey, we want all drinking age, the state law, we want the minimum drinking age nationwide to be 21, right? How do we accomplish this? Well, we can't directly require this. We can't pass a federal law that just says, hey, the drinking age has to be 21, right? We have to tie that into the spending power or the taxing power or one of our other powers, the commerce power, right? And they go with the spending power, right? Okay, well, we know that we can spend, we have the power to spend to provide for the common defense and general welfare. So we can tie this objective to the spending power. And we can condition federal funding, right, where we're going to spend our federal dollars to indirectly regulate the states and make sure that, hey, look, if you really want to, you can lower the drinking age. You're just not going to get as much money from us. Of course, that's a high incentive to keep the drinking age at 21, right? And they can do that because it's tied into the spending power. 
right? Very important to recognize here, right? That we're saying Congress has the power to spend, right? This is an operative word. Congress has the power to spend to provide for the common defense and general welfare, right? Sometimes students confuse this clause of general welfare with kind of like a general police power, right? Congress does not have a general police power, right? They can't just pass any law they want to provide for the common defense and general welfare, right? That's not going to work, right? That would be extremely broad, right? This is limited. Congress has the power to spend to provide for the common defense and general welfare. So this taxing and spending relationship, right? The tax has to bear some reasonable relationship to revenue production and Congress is, whatever that law is that they're passing, has to deal with spending, right? To provide for the common defense and general welfare, right? Otherwise, Congress could just pass a law that says, hey, look, the minimum drinking age nationwide to provide for the general welfare there of our people right has to be 21 or 25 they could set whatever they number they wanted because they're saying hey look to make sure that our streets our highways are safe right the drinking age has to be 21 and that would be the end of the analysis right but it has to be tied to spending right to federal funding which is what they're doing in south dakota v dole which is why it's upheld just very important to recognize that congress does not have any type of general police power this is a you know famous wrong answer on constitutional law multiple choice questions right on the bar exam the bar examiners love to do this right and i'm sure law school professors are the same they love to have a law that looks like passed by Congress that really looks like it's providing for the general welfare. And one of the answer choices will be, yes, this law will be upheld because Congress under the general welfare or the general police power that Congress has, right? So it would be something like, hey, to prevent drinking and driving accidents, Congress is going to pass a law that raises the drinking age nationwide to 21, you'll always have an answer choice that says, yes, this law will be upheld because it provides for the general welfare of the people under Article 1, Section 8. That's always a wrong answer, right? There is no general police power, right? It has to be tied to taxing and spending if we're thinking about common defense and general welfare. Congress has no general police power. So if you see that, you know, because of Congress's general police power or something like that, it's almost always going to be a wrong answer. Just remember that this has to be tied, like South Dakota v. Dole, to federal funding, right? Or to the taxing power and the Affordable Care Act or the spending power in a case like South Dakota v. Dole, right? But the main takeaway from the taxing and spending power I really want to resonate with everybody is this idea that Congress is allowed to start with this intent, right? This legislative intent or this legislative objective, and they can get crafty. They can pull out their constitution and use the taxing and spending powers to incentivize or discourage behavior, right? To indirectly regulate or indirectly accomplish the goal that they're trying to accomplish they're allowed to do that right under the taxing and spending powers sometimes on fact patterns it'll look like hey can congress really do that you know they're kind of just bending the constitution a little bit to do something that they otherwise couldn't do right don't worry about that stuff they are allowed to do it right that is very well established law after Butler, United States v. Butler, right, it goes through this evolution of case law where today we understand that Congress is allowed to do that. Okay, which takes us to the commerce power, right? This is maybe the most broad or the most important power Congress has. They're really going to rely heavily on this power to pass all kinds of different laws, right? The idea being under Article 1, Section 8, Congress has the power to regulate foreign and interstate commerce, right? So the first thing we have to establish is, well, what do we mean by commerce, right? Commerce in the United States, right, typically refers to the voluntary exchange of money for goods or services, right? So when we say 
interstate commerce, we're really talking about the buying, selling, or moving of product, services, or money across state borders. Right? So think about all the things that this can really encompass. The buying, selling, or moving of products, services, or money across state borders. Right? So typically you're going to see this broken into three major categories. Right? We're going to say Congress has the power to regulate the channels of interstate commerce, which is things like roadways, airways, waterways, anywhere we're moving products or money across state borders, right? The actual channels that are being used to move products or services or money across state lines, like roadways, airways, waterways. Also, the instrumentalities of interstate commerce, right? This is trucks, airplanes, the vehicles that are being used, including the people in the vehicles that are moving, right? The products and services and money across state lines, right? Trucks, airplanes, boats, ships, trains, whatever it is, right? The instrumentalities of interstate commerce and or the big one, any activity that has a substantial effect on interstate commerce, right? This is things like regulating interstate production, shipment, or distribution. Again, anything, any activity that involves the buying, selling, or moving of products, services, or money across state borders, right? Any activity involved in that that has a substantial effect on interstate commerce, right? Congress has the power under Article 1, Section 8 to regulate. Right? Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it. 
uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.